Hello there and welcome to Frankie Sent Some More. We are here with my friend Brent Marchand and it's May and it's time for May movie reviews. So welcome. Hi hey, Frankie. How's it going? Good, how are you? Excellent. We, we've got some uh, a very interesting mix of movies this time uh, from a variety of different sources. Uh, so let's get right to it. All right. Okay, so the first movie we've got is a coming-of-age drama set in Chicago's Cabrini Green housing project in the early 90s called We Grown Now. And this is probably one of the best coming-of-age movies I have ever seen. It's really very, very touching uh, it's got moments that are fun. It's got moments that'll, you know, you'll want to get the hankies out. Uh, it tells the story of two young boys who have been the best of friends since birth and the various trials and tribulations that they face, not just in terms of being in such a difficult living situation as Cabrini Green was at the time, uh, but also, you know, just the everyday growing up experiences that we have to go through in becoming adults. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's really kind of hard to envision how anybody would be able to cope with those kinds of things under those kinds of conditions. But they managed to do it basically because they recognize their own self-worth, their own value. And even though some of these experiences that are particular to their circumstances, as well as to just the general growing up phase, uh, are new to them, they managed to get by. And they and they learn a lot in the process, and it's it's a in many ways it's a good learning experience from them because this is a film that shows um, Chicago at its best and its worst. I mean, you see all the things Your that city, <laughs> you know it well. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's all the things that make this city great and all the things that make this city make that make people want to stay away from it essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is set right around the time of the shooting of seven-year-old Dantrell Davis in the early 90s, which was a big story, not just here, but nationally. Uh, he was walking to school with his mother and was shot and killed. And the impact of that led to a real crackdown at the housing facility. So in many ways, in addition to having to face the difficulties of being in a crime-ridden neighborhood, these kids were also living almost in kind of a police state yeah. in terms of the way, you know, things were being managed. But they get by, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they've got each other. And that's really important to, to recognize that, you know, when we're, when we're coming of age, it's always best to have someone along for the ride as a companion. Um, the film is beautifully shot. It's beautifully edited. Uh, the performances are phenomenal, particularly the two kids. I mean, they're just so natural in the way they portray their parts that you would never think that if they were actors, you would think that they were just a couple of kids that they, you know, hired off the street, say, hey, come in and do this movie for well, us. They did hire them off the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I think one of them was a Disney kid. Oh, I think. Not mistaken. So um, and it's got a good supporting cast as well. Um, I really, really like this movie a lot. Uh, it earns three 2023 Independent Spirit Award nominations, including Best Picture. Uh, I'm disappointed that it didn't win because uh, I really thought it was the best of the bunch. Um, it also, um, it, it faced kind of a delayed release. I'm not really sure what was behind that, but it, it didn't come out until April of this year, even though it was up for an award last year. Yeah. Last year it was just primarily playing at film festivals. It was in it was on Apple and they've taken it off and I don't understand why. Yeah, I, I, that's kind of strange. I mean, I, I don't... want to release it again. I can't imagine why they would... Unless they put it on Disney, maybe. I don't know. Could be. I don't know. I mean, it, it was released... It was a release from Sony Pictures Classics. So, I mean... Um, that company is sometimes a little bit on the slow side for getting its movies into streaming. So, I mean, maybe it'll come back there at some point. But uh, in any event, I really urge viewers to to look for this one when they have the opportunity to find it, because I think they'll really find it enjoying. And, you know, one of the things that my, my I saw with my partner, he and I both said that there's virtually nothing in this movie that 
everybody can't relate to in one way or another, regardless of whether they grew up under circumstances sure. like that or not. These are all part of part and parcel of what it's like to be a kid and discovering your world and having to accept that they're just doing it under more unusual and more trying circumstances than most of us. Right. Right. But I really, I really like this a lot. And, um, this is one that I'm going to give five out of five to. Okay. Very. I don't know if you've ever given a five out of five. It's pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. That's amazing. Okay. Five out of five folks. Get see, we, we grow now. <laughs> All right. Okay, so next we have another picture from Sony Pictures Classics called Freud's Last Session, which is a, a, a kind of a what if sort of drama that's set in 1939, not long before Sigmund Freud died. He held a what was considered to be his final session with a patient who was an Oxford scholar, uh, was never officially identified, but it's believed to have been author C.S. Lewis. And I, he didn't go there as a patient, did he? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because the terms of how the, the meeting came about are a little bit on the vague side. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, they don't even know specifically that it was C.S. Lewis. But in either case, like, this is a like I say, this is a what if kind right. of situation. Right. And the two of them get together for what ends up being a very lengthy conversation about all of life's big issues regarding fear, um, relationships, uh, spirituality, religion, science, atheism, the whole bit. Yep. And it's in many ways, it's almost like a series of dialogues that are put together over the course of the day between these two. And it's interesting in the fact that how many movies typically take on subject matter like this and debate it in such detail as they do here? Now, this was originally based on a stage play, and it may seem a little stagey to some people when they're watching it. However, the content of the conversations to me was so engaging that I couldn't turn away from it. I mean, I just was sort of glued to the screen when I was watching this. Uh, and the performances are just impeccable. And this is probably one of the best and most underrated performances that Anthony Hopkins has ever given uh, in his role as Freud. Uh, it's also features a very fine performance by Matthew Good as C.S. Lewis. And the two of them together have a great chemistry on screen in terms of the way they carry out their dialogues, the way they talk about these things. And I, I really recommend this highly to anybody who's interested in finding material that's enriching and not just entertaining. Um, if anybody's expecting, you know, lots of bombs going off and things like that, well, you're not going to get that here with this. This is not that kind of a picture. But if you're interested in getting some thoughtful insight into some of these different areas, this is very a very good example of a film to watch for doing that. Um, I have to I have to disagree with you on one in one area. Being of Austrian descent, uh, and I'm watching I'm watching and I love Anthony Hopkins, but every I mean they put in too many yaw yaw yaw, you know, like and and it didn't sound like he was speaking German, you know, and and it was just kind of like it was distracting to me. I found it a little bit distracting, the the yaws. So they they weren't necessary. If he wasn't going to speak in a German accent, then don't put it in. Yeah. You know what I mean? uh, that's that's certainly understandable. I mean, um, I, as I understand it, Freud was supposedly fluent in English. So, I mean, um, it almost seems like they threw in something they almost didn't have to. Yes. In the dialogue, you know, with the way they handled that. Well, you might have spoken with a German accent, which is yeah. fine. But, you know, if he did speak with a German accent, English with a German accent, which I know a lot of people do. He would have had a German accent. Yeah. If he didn't have the German accent, then he probably wouldn't have done the yaw. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, and once well, twice, okay. But like every, almost every other <laughs> sentence, was, oh God, now I'm, I'm cringing now. <laughs> well, one, of, one of the other things I liked about this film is the way it handled its flashbacks, where yeah. it was giving you the backstory behind why each of them held to the particular views that they did with regard to the subjects that they were discussing. Uh, that's particularly true where uh, the Lewis character is concerned when he was flashing back to his experience during World War One as a soldier. Yeah. 
and that being the primary source of his fear now that it was 1939 and you know they were faced with yet another war with germany coming up at at that time yeah. um so it that was something that was very nicely integrated into the film uh i was very pleased the way to see that they handled that um there were a few places in the film where the flow in the story was a little hiccupy in my in my view but up beyond that uh i thought this was well worth the watch uh you learn some very interesting things about freud's character in particular that i had known previously um and that makes for some interesting viewing as well uh that he was not necessarily the the quote unquote saint that a lot of people thought him to be that he had his flaws just like everybody else everybody yeah um but uh, I, I really, I really like this one a lot, and it's available for streaming uh, online. And I would give it four out of five. Interesting, you know, the after after fact that they talk, they they touch on his on his cancer, his oral cancer, his mouth cancer, um, and yet afterwards, you know, people today, doctors today, would say he probably did not have it, um, throat cancer or, or mouth cancer, because or the soft palate because he lasted so long. And yeah. so they felt that it was from, um, from the medication, the cocaine that he was taking for the pain yeah. actually caused, not that he didn't, wasn't a huge smoker, but that's actually what he was. Yeah. You very for. rarely saw him without a cigar. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from, from a child, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, after all, a cigar is just a cigar, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's nothing to do with having an oral fixation. <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all okay so next we have a third film from sony pictures classics uh called the miracle club which is a movie set in 1967 tells the story of four women who live in a small irish coastal town who My end up favorite going... actresses of all time almost. yeah it's a really great cast i mean really well put together and and they all give really good performances on top of it um they, uh, they live in a small Irish coastal town, and they all end up going on a pilgrimage to Lourdes to work out various emotional and physical problems that they're each facing. And it's very uh, intriguing to see the way the relationships among these women are put together and they unfold over the course of the film. Uh, it, it talks a lot about questions of faith, questions of forgiveness, and a question of really what the source of miracles in one's life really are and that in many ways we're responsible for making our own miracles even though we don't always realize that right um, with that we think it somehow has to come from some outside source well maybe that helps it along but the intent is still coming from you and that's an important point that this film makes that a lot a lot of times is not really driven home in these kinds of stories as well as it could be yeah, yeah. And it, it's kind of a question. It's almost like fate is it keeps drawing you, though, keeps pulling those strings to bring things around. It's up to you to see it. Yes, absolutely. Now, there are some aspects of the story that are a little schmaltzy, uh, that are a little predictable. Uh, some of the humor, particularly involving the women's husbands, is a little out of date. Um, that was 1967. But... <laughs> yeah, but yeah, well, that's just it. I mean, a lot of people were a lot of people have been very critical of that saying, oh, well, that's just like such an old joke. And I'm like, well, it's 1967. I mean, right. people thought like, that especially, way at that time. Especially you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, I really um I I would put a few qualifiers on this one in terms of it's you cute. know it's sweet. I it's like it's it. cute, it's enjoyable, it's a it's a good family movie, I think. Yeah. I mean yeah. Um, and I mean, we don't discuss family movies all that often on here, but this is one that I think would qualify in the front. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I Kathy Bates. So I can't see her and Laura Linney being the best friends. Like they they don't seem in the same age group for having grown up to be best friends. Uh, yeah. Unless just living in that little village compared to going to Boston and being more sophisticated brought that out. But it's, it could it's, be. I mean, because I mean, chronologically, in terms of age, they're not that far apart. So, I mean, it's not inconceivable, you know, that something like that could have happened. It just could be 
a victim of circumstances. I mean, I believe they said in the film at one point that, you know, Kathy Bates's character was a mother of 10. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would, that that might age you quite a bit right yeah, there. That's, you true. Know? that's true. <laughs> you know, so. Um, Even right, oh my God, did he ever age? <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the the one thing I really liked about about Kathy Bates's performance in particular is how well she pulls off an Irish accent. Oh yeah, I mean it's very convincing. Yeah, you know I've seen uh, I've seen Maggie Smith do Irish characters before, so it didn't seem wow. like that big of a, a leap of faith for her. But for Kathy Bates, I've never seen her tackle anything like this, and she does it really quite well. She is an exceptional actress. She really is. Um, so, like I say, this is this is one where the, the cast was really very well put together. Uh, and even a lot of the supporting players who are lesser known were yeah. all very well cast. So um, this movie is currently streaming on Netflix in case anybody wants to see it. Um, it really kind of came and went from theaters really fast. Late oh, I didn't know it was on Netflix. I, I read yeah. it on Apple. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably on other, it's probably on other platforms too. I saw it on Netflix, but um it's um it's one film that I found that has been sort of kind of unfairly criticized in some ways, which I objected to a little bit. But um, yeah, I won't say it's not without issues, but it's certainly not as flawed, I think, as some critics and viewers have made it out to be. So I'd say this is a, a good, you know, like Sunday afternoon kind of movie to watch with the family. And I would give it three and a half out of five. Yeah, me too. I definitely, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, so next up, next up. we have a Canadian movie, um, which just recently finished its um, theatrical play here in the U.S. I think it'll probably be coming to streaming pretty soon. Uh, it's already available for streaming in Canada. So if you're up north, you're, you can have ready access to this one. It's called I Like Movies. And this is a story of a 17 year old high school senior who is aspiring to become a filmmaker. And he knows a lot about movies and he appears to have some degree of talent. Um, and he's also got quite an attitude in terms of who he is and what he's able to do and how in many ways um, people should sort of almost bow down to him for his knowledge and expertise and so forth. And it results in a very big lesson in comeuppance. <laughs> um, it's uh, set in 2003, but I, I'm sure that there are many who can relate to the message of um, entitlement <laughs> that's real, that's coming through in this film that applies to the current generation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he he gets it hard. I mean, it comes through in very difficult ways. Now, in his defense, he has had some psychological troubles and he's had some tragedies happen in his life. But that doesn't automatically entitle him to a pass to do what he wants, when he wants, in whatever way he wants. And he gets a lot of that thrown back in his face when he does that. So this is, in many ways, another coming-of-age story, but in a very different way from we've grown now in terms of the fact that he's having to learn some very hard lessons that he's resisting learning, no matter how much talent or expertise he may have in a particular area. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to put a disclaimer on this one. I think my, my husband walked out in the first three minutes, and I think, and I said, wait, wait, come back. Like, that's just them doing, you know it starts off so weird and, and strange and that you think that the whole movie is this, but what it really was is them doing an acting job or play or movie for a class. Yeah, it was one of his, it was for his media studies class project. Yeah. So he thought the whole movie was this and, sh and it just, you couldn't take any left. <laughs> so he was, but watch a little bit longer than five minutes if you can. Well, and, and, and the thing is, I mean, that is actually a very, a very effective way of illustrating what the character is all about. I mean, he was supposed to be doing a movie that was an assignment illustrating bias in media, and he did something completely different from what the teacher asked for. And he felt absolutely entitled to say, well, I thought this was a better assignment. I thought this was a better project, so that's why I did this and didn't do what you asked for. Yeah. Well, how far is that going to get you in the world? I mean, especially if you're 
you know, a young aspiring filmmaker and you're trying to make your way in a studio system that's basically pointing a finger at you and saying, this is what you're going to direct. Yeah. You know? Somebody's giving you money and said, we want this. And then you do something totally different. Uh-huh. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, yeah. But, you know, it, it, again, and also, in all fairness, I'm sure we all went through geeky, goofy periods like that ourselves when we were that age and had to experience some difficult lessons along the way. So in many ways, it'll probably be kind of almost nostalgic or a throwback to some of the stuff that we might have done at that point in our lives. Um, but it's something that we all have to get at some point. And this movie illustrates that. Uh, and it points out what the consequences are going to be if you don't. Yeah. And I think that's a very important message for a lot of people to get, especially those of the current generation who are just feeling this unbridled sense of entitlement to whatever they want, whenever they want to do it. So I would give this one uh, three and a half stars. Um, as I say, it's available for streaming in Canada. It will probably be available for streaming in the U.S. in the not too distant future. I think that's um, very generous. I would do it. The, I, the one thing, I, the one thing that I did have a bit of an issue with on the film is that there are there are some bits in it that kind of come out of left field, and they don't really integrate into the main narrative as well as they probably could or should have, which I found a little strange. I mean, they were still funny, but my feeling when I was watching was like, well, how does this connect with everything else that you're doing? Yeah. So that was my biggest complaint with it, but. Okay. But you know what? Everybody has their own cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so next we have a new documentary that's out and available for streaming right now about the actor Gene Wilder called Remembering Gene Wilder. And this is a, it's a pretty straightforward chronological uh, presentation of his life and career, but it really does things that um, help to kind of separate it from a lot of other biographies and also provide some new insights into Wilder as an individual and as a professional that maybe went overlooked during the course of his career. It starts out, of course, with his big successes from the beginning of his career with, you know, uh, the producers and Willy Wonka and uh, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, and so forth. But it also gets into his later films, which weren't as well received critically, but as they're shown in the picture here, you get to see little nuances of his performances that probably may not have been picked up on. Things that really help to make the performance more meaningful than it might have been recognized as being. Um, and it, it also gets into his involvement, particularly professionally working with other actors who all were saying that this man is very generous. He helps us be better performers. Um, and even in the case of the, the young actor who played the, the boy in Willy Wonka, he's now grown up. He talks about the idea that, um, you know, he treated me like an equal. He didn't treat me like a kid. And because of that, he helped him to strengthen his performance and get more out of him than he might have otherwise. I, I think the problem with actors and people like like Gene Wilder, people who came out of Second City, people who who are comedians, is that you expect them to be a Blazing Saddles character for the rest of their life. Yeah. yeah. And we don't give them that pass to grow and, and mature as an actor. Yes. But when they're not, Adam Sandler can kind of sometimes do it. But when they're not, you know, the the funny guy or or the weird schlocky guy or the young Frankenstein guy, then we oh that wasn't any good. Yeah, exactly. And um, some of it might have also been due to the writing that was involved in some of the later projects that he worked on. Some of which he wrote himself, some of which were written by other people. Um, and if they don't quite measure up, well, I've always said that when it comes to a movie, if you don't have the writing, you don't have the picture. Yeah. And and I think that may have plagued, you know, some of his later roles in, in, in many ways. But he ended up um, becoming an individual who, you know, took on other projects as well. And that's something else that isn't as widely known. He became a painter. He became an author. Uh, he started doing a lot of television work. And in fact, in one of his last uh, performances, 
he made several guest appearances on the, the sitcom Will and Grace, for which he won an Emmy. I mean, you know, he he did a lot of things that just wow. aren't widely known as much as his early work. And this film brings all of that front and center. Uh, it also brings forth a lot of things that he did uh, in terms of offering up his generosity of spirit. That's particularly poignant in the segment of the film where it talks about his marriage to Gilda Radner and when she was diagnosed with cancer, everything he did to help her out and everything he helped it to do uh, people who were afflicted with ovarian cancer, even after she died. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, she was, he was really very, very generous. And that's something that has kind of flown under the radar that people don't recognize about him. But thankfully this movie, yeah. uh, you know, brings that out. Um, and it also uh, points out the fact that he was somebody who was willing to take on chancy roles that maybe a lot of other actors might not have wanted to take on. Um, his role, his small role in Bonnie and Clyde, um, his role as the doctor who fell in love in the sheep and everything you, everything you always want to know about sex. I mean, um, whom, how many other actors would necessarily be willing to yeah, you know, go with yeah. something as outrageous <laughs> or off the wall as that. Well, but, you know, when, like when you watch that, it's <laughs> even all these many years later, it's still hilarious, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, he really, in many ways, was he was an underrated talent. Um, he did receive two Oscar nominations. He was nominated for Supporting Actor for the Producers, and he was nominated for Writing for Young Frankenstein. Um it's a shame that he didn't get more recognition than he did because he really did do a lot of stuff. Um, but this film really helps to, I think, make up for some of those oversights. So I would, if you're a fan of, of Wilders, I definitely recommend watching this. If it's somebody who you don't know much about or would like to know more, again, I would recommend watching it. Uh, and I would end up giving this one four stars. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I, I think people like Gene Wilder, they don't do the, the the social impact stuff, the cancer stuff for kudos. They don't do it for that. He did it for love. And I think that's why it wasn't as known. Why? Yeah, I mean, he really, I mean, he loved a lot of what he was doing, regardless of what kind of reception he got for. And that was important because, um, you know, we see so many people these days who are doing movies just for a paycheck. Yeah. And given the fact that he was his own inspiration behind a lot of the projects that he worked on, there was no guarantee of that going in. So, um, but certainly the ones that he's, he's best remembered for, you'll never forget. I mean, well, you know, I mean, who can forget young Frankenstein or blazing saddles? And, and I wonder, like, is it the time, like, was it our age and the time and the, and, you know, like if I watch it today, would I still laugh? I don't know. I would laugh because I remembered it. It was funny. Do you know? Like if it's it's like seventies music. It's so good to us, and our kids kind of go, eh. But it's classic. It's classic rock, and you. Never well, you almost you almost have to wonder how many of this, of some of his early films would even get remade today. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the for example, the producers, where you know, it's a movie about a a producer doing a tax scam to try and produce a Broadway flop as he can make more money that way. And he ends up choosing a play titled Springtime for Hitler. I mean, yeah. how well would that fly today? Especially since... Well, it didn't go on Broadway. For, didn't Nathan yeah. Lane do it on Broadway for real? Yeah. I thought he did it. Well, especially since Springtime for Hitler was the original title of the film also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, And it was yeah. written by Mel Brooks. I mean, you know... It was funny, and yeah. and Frank is, young Frankenstein was hilarious. I mean, it was. I just remember being in the movie theater and just like dying. I was like on the floor laughing so hard. But you know, and and, and when it comes to Blazing Saddles, I mean, that's oh, come that's under so good. much criticism for, you Not know, it's, racist, it's, it's probably <laughs> so-called racist sentiments, and yet this is one that was promoting the fact about the evils of discrimination. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like people today who have criticized that they're missing the whole point of what they the are. movie is about. Yeah, you know? they don't get it. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, would Blazing Saddles be made today? Probably not. It, you know? They wouldn't allow it to be made. 
a satire like that. I mean, people just don't get it. It's a satire. Hello? Like, you know, like and the fact, I mean, you know, it one of the authors of the script was Richard Pryor. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're, you're going to criticize an African-American writer for writing things that, you know, might be seemingly too sensitive for... Well, wow, everything that Richard Pryor said was too sensitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, exactly, exactly. For most people, yeah. for most people, yeah. It, it was, it, one of the other things yeah. that's interesting about that movie in particular, too, is the fact that Gene Wilder was not the original choice to play the Waco Kid. He was a replacement for Gig Young, who was recovering a recovering alcoholic at the time and was unable to live up to his commitment. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, I mean, what a, a stroke of casting substitution that here's some a character who is memorable in film history. Yeah. Who almost didn't play the part to start with. Talk about fate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great. That was great. You guys should watch it if you haven't seen it. So uh, among our new movies, uh, the last one that we have for, uh, for review today is another documentary. And that's a film called Your Fat Friend, which is a film profiling fat activist Aubrey Gordon. Um, this is a film that uh, talks about her rise to fame from an anonymous blogger to a best-selling author who has basically taken on the subject of fat activism, basically because she is saying, you know, you've taken steps to address virtually every other form of prejudice that's out there except this one. And this one you just keep getting away with without any consequences. And she said, if, you know, put yourself in my shoes try and fit in an airplane seat, try and fit in a theater seat, uh, try and go to your doctor's office and have a blood pressure cuff that's going to comfortably fit around your arm. You know, I mean, that combined with the, the attitudes that are just sort of summarily, you know, yeah. um, thrust against people who are fat, run into these problems. And she said, it's about time that we do something about this. And that's what her, this film is all about. She does a very eloquent job of explaining herself, explaining how it came about. Um, and uh, it, it's really very eye-opening, I think, to a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily uh, re realize or understand what this was like unless they actually had gone through circumstances like that for himself. I think people she, are rude, you know, without thinking. And and I, I know it just because... I've, I've experienced it before, but just people think that they can say whatever's on their mind and that's yeah. okay. And it, people, it's not okay. Like keep your mouth shut. Like if you don't know somebody, it's not up to you to go up and tell them don't eat or are you sure you want to eat that? Or, you know, you don't know what's going on in their mind, in their brain, in their body, nothing. You don't know nothing. So well, okay. some of it is just so simplistic and ignorant too, where they come up and say things like just lose some weight. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, just go out and earn a million dollars. I mean, yeah, yeah. Same, you know, same principle. How, how can you realistically do that until you actually experience something like that? And I mean, not everybody I, can just lose weight by not eating. Not everybody no. can. And they have to understand, they don't understand. Oprah tried to tell people, you know, on her stuff yeah. a little while ago, it is in the brain. There's some people, some people can do it, but there's, it's like uh, alcoholics or in other, other addictions that is in the brain. And I'm not saying the food is an addiction, although the body treats it where it doesn't want to release no exactly. matter what you do. And exactly. You do something else to help yourself. So and, and it's that, a very difficult position. And that's, the, and that's the point that I think most people just don't get. They just don't understand. It. I mean, it's, yeah. it's almost like uh, the same difficulties that people have with quitting smoking. Yeah. You know, I mean, people who have never smoked and coming up to a smoker and say, why don't you just give up that filthy, disgusting habit? Yeah. Why don't you try doing it if you've never done it? Right. See how difficult it is. It's very difficult. And food is even harder because food you have to eat to live. Yeah. So, you know, you can give up a cigarette and if you never have to touch it again or look at it, that's okay. But you always have to put food in your body. Exactly. So that makes it more difficult, doubly more yeah. difficult, I think. But um, even, even as a, you know, hypnotherapist, which I was, and am, uh, you know, getting people, uh, doing hypnosis for people, to, to quit eating some can some can't but it really does depend on the on the brain and how many times you know some that that it's an individual thing a lot of people just like to eat 
we can be honest yeah. like that. But other people, they their bodies just put weight on and there's no rhyme or reason. Yeah. They just can't help it. And that's it. Yeah. And that seems to have been the case with her and the fact that she just started getting big at a young age, wasn't really overeating to speak of, um, doesn't overeat today. And yet her ability to shed pounds yeah. just isn't there. Most large people don't overeat. No. Don't overeat. It's less than, than the people I know who are thin. It's yeah. true. It's true. No, I, I, I mean, I can attest to that myself. It's a problem I've been facing my entire life. And the the ridicule and the abuse that I faced from a young from a young age always baffled me. Yeah, I mean, it, it hurt, but it baffled me too. And the fact that people would come up and say, you know, call me names for being big and so forth, and I'd say, what? why should that matter? Yeah, what difference does that make? So I'm carrying some extra pounds. So what? Yeah, it's how is this affecting you? Exactly. You know, and yet Aubrey in the film. It talks about some of the comments that she received when she was at least uh, blogging anonymously at the, at the beginning where people were saying things like, you don't deserve to live. You know, you just, you're fat and you're disgusting and you, you shouldn't even be around here. Yeah. Why would anybody say that? Yeah. I just don't understand that. They're just cruel and ignorant people. The same people who are racist and prejudiced and it's those same people. Yeah. It's those same people with small minds. You know? So one of the things that really helped is when she finally did become, when she did come above the surface, started doing things using her name. Uh, she published a couple of books. She's got a podcast out there. She now has this huge, and I do mean huge following of people behind her who came up to her. And there's one scene in the movie where she's doing a book signing where they are just so grateful and so thankful saying it's so wonderful to have an advocate out there fighting for us for these things who are making the world aware of what all of us who are situated like this go through on a daily basis. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're larger, you have to buy two seats on a plane. Yeah. You have to get an extended seat belt. That's, that's embarrassing. Yep. You know, there it's not designed. World's not designed for larger people. It, it really no. isn't. And even, you know, one of the one of the areas where you would think you would find some meaningful help and assistance from the healthcare community, you don't get it there either. I mean, she talks about the idea of going into a doctor's office to talk about a particular issue, say like a skin rash or something, and it invariably ends up turning back into a conversation about weight loss. Right. Well, you know what? That's not why I came in. I came in to talk to you about my skin rash. Right. Why are you bringing this other stuff up every single time? Right. And I mean, it's something that's enough to cause people to start becoming resentful about. And the fact that you're constantly being made to feel that you're less than whole, that right. you're less than entitled to be deserving of good health, of, you know, or love you. or friendship. Yeah. Or anything, anything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, this is a film that um, I, I really like. Uh, there are a few things in it that could have been a little better organized. And a few things I think that they could have cut that didn't really necessarily add a whole lot to it. Um, but I would give this three and a half out of five. Um, it is um, it is available for streaming from, uh, I think it's a relatively new movie streaming site called Jolt that specializes in documentaries. That's the only place I've been able to find it. So Yeah, and I, I was on their site and they said that, you know, it's free until the end of May. And then they wanted fifteen dollars. Yeah, that was a little weird too. <laughs> Which is quite a lot of money, I think, for someone. I, I know. Um, but but you know, I, I I I'd rather I'd rather pay out a few extra bucks to be able to see a movie that's worthwhile watching. Yeah. That is probably not going to be widely available elsewhere, and yeah. this is one of them. So, yeah. I kind of look forward to see what they have to offer in the future with other documentaries. So, this next one really hurts my heart. Yeah, this is, uh, we're closing out with a film that I would recommend people staying away from. Um, it's called Babes. And this is a film that basically follows uh, the relationship of two lifelong friends through the stages of adult female friendship and childbirth and uh, early parenthood. And I was really looking forward to it because the trailer really looked quite enticing. But the film just isn't that funny. Um, 
Well, that's funny because I thought the trailer was was a, a letdown and, and it just was too crude for and I love Michelle. Michelle Buteau is like my favorite, favorite person. She she has a show on Netflix, two seasons of waiting for season three. She's hilarious, she's wonderful. I love her personality, I love everything about her. I did not like this. Just, well, the thing that I found kind of interesting is that and kind of ironic for me is, is that I actually thought it worked best when it was at its raunchiest, which is not something I typically say. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the other stuff, it just felt like the two characters were trying way too hard to get your attention, to get you to laugh. Um, I also found, didn't find their characters terribly believable in the fact that they were supposedly mothers, mo you know, professionals who were like incredibly immature yeah. in so many ways Yeah, that I had a hard time really fathoming how they would get themselves into some of the circumstances that they get themselves into. So I was going, am I too old? Is that why I'm feeling this way right now? You know what I mean? Like, it was just like, maybe, you know, you're old when, but I just think it just wasn't Good. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things that you saw on the poster is uh, one of the critics described it as, as um, the bridesmaids of making babies. Yeah. I thought Bridesmaids was a much funnier it movie. Was a funny movie. It was I hilarious. mean, I really enjoy that. I mean, even, though, even though some of the things in Bridesmaids were kind of on the preposterous side, they were still genuinely funny. The stuff that's presented as being preposterous here it's was preposterous. just preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to spoil this for viewers in case they yeah. want, to, but yeah. but there's one scene younger, where maybe a younger audience would love it. Where where there where there where she's babysitting a young child and shows them a certain movie that has certain consequences to it, and my feeling was like, who would show a child a movie like that? Yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, I, it just sort of struck me as something that might have come up as part time dad, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it might have come up as an idea for a scene, you yeah. know, during a stone stoner moment or something like that. But yeah. when it plays out in terms of the way it's presented, it just it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there were also an awful lot of things I found that were very episodic about the film where you would have one scene where the, the characters have like some kind of falling out. And the next thing you know, they're back talking to each other like nothing happened. Well, where was the apology that came in between to bring them back well, together? Well, sometimes good friends are like that. I, I've been there, especially females. But yeah, I know what you mean. Like you have to. It have just it, it just it didn't seem like there was a logic that was following the flow of the script. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even if it's just something like it's a quick yeah. one off, like hey, forget it, or something like that. Yeah. But there was nothing. I mean, it was just like, okay, I'm angry at you. Hey, let's do this, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of those kinds of very strong disconnects between one scene and the next that I yeah. found kind of annoying and frustrating. Um, but watch out the other stuff she's done because she's she's funny as heck. And I really love her. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving this one two and a half stars. I think I'm being kind of generous yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I, I mean, the stuff that was funny was funny. I won't deny that, but there wasn't nearly enough of it. Um, particularly given the fact that this is a subject that really hasn't been explored in other films as fully as it is here. Yeah. I mean, um, I, it would seem to me that yeah, this is this is good fodder for a script for a subject like this, but it just it just didn't pan out and. You know, I would I would say um, if you really want to watch it, wait for it to come to streaming. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend shelling out theater prices for this. Um, of course, based on what happened at the movie box office over Memorial Day weekend here, theater owners are probably don't want to hear something like that. Um, but right now, I just to kind of give viewers a heads up for what might be ahead for the summer. This looks like it may be a disastrous summer movie season in terms of box office. Uh, Memorial Day is typically one of the biggest box office weekends of the year. And with two major releases coming out, uh, it was horrendous. It was the worst box office in like what came out for you? I know if was here and, and I mean, the two movies that came out here were the new Garfield movie. Yeah. And uh, Furiosa, the new Mad Max movie. Right, right, 
Right. And um, Mad Max made, I think, like 32 million, which, I mean, the marketing costs that much for that movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was expected to be one of the ones that was going to blow away everybody at the box office this summer. Didn't do it. Um, and in terms of the releases that come out for the rest of the summer, they tend to be weaker than that. So, I mean, yeah, you know, theater owners, studios, distributors, uh, they might be in for a rough summer ahead. So now there are a few things coming out that I'm looking forward to. Um, there's a comedy coming out with June Squibb called Thelma about a, uh, an elderly woman who has her money ripped off an internet scam and seeks her revenge to get everything back. I love her too. She was the crotchety old mother in Nebraska. If anybody remembers, yeah, yeah. got an Oscar nomination for that. Uh, and there's also a new film coming out uh, from uh, Yorgos Lanthimos who made poor things called kinds of kindness, which again, features another role with Emma Stone in it. Nice. So I'm really looking forward to those two. They're both coming out at the end of June. So keep an eye out for those. All right. Well, there you got it. <laughs> so uh, so that's what we got for now. I mean, you know, these are the movies that I mentioned were, you know, kind of holdovers from the late spring season in many ways, which turned out to be a lot better than I expected. Um I'm I'm hoping that summer will somehow make up for it, but at this point, I have my doubts. So we'll see. All right. Well, thank you, Brent, for that. You're quite thank welcome, you, everybody. We take care. Adios, and see you in June. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.